Deborah Archer is the president of the American Civil Liberties Union and is the first black woman to hold this position in the organization's 101-year history. She's also a tenured professor and the co-faculty director at the Center on Race, Inequality, and the Law at NYU Law. Deborah, it's great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Let me ask you kind of a you know tough meta question at the beginning. Um, you know, I, I saw the tweet that you just shared. Uh, it was called Race in America. The judge needs to be reminded that his victims are not on trial. Uh, and this had to do with the framing um, of those, those victims. I'm going to call them victims of Kyle Rittenhouse, where the judge in that case decided uh, that victim is too loaded a word, uh, but let the lawyers call them rioters, looters, or arsonists. I guess the question I have from this and just reading this is, are the, I, I, I mean, the ACLU pursues everyone's rights because there's a fundamental faith that the legal system will somehow deliver and be strong and impervious and come out right in the end. And I often ask people who are on, you know, the, I, I won't call it, you know, on, on the side of the equation in America where, where they've been neglected or demeaned or left alone, do they trust the system to deliver? So my question to you is really about the legal infrastructure of this country, is do you trust it to perform in a way that delivers? So thank you for having me, and that's a, a good question. I think, yes, fundamentally, as someone who is a lawyer and engages in the legal process, that I believe at the end of the day, uh, that if we push and pull and fight and engage within our legal system, that we're going to see change. Uh, but of course, the legal system has not only been a source and tool for justice and equity, it's also been a source and tool for the inequality and oppression that we see. So although our legal system, I think, is an important tool for advancing uh, civil rights and civil liberties, it's not the only tool. And so the work that we do has to include the legal advocacy, but also building power and capacity in our communities. It has to include engaging in legislative uh, reform and policy reform, public education. We certainly, in order to move the needle uh, towards more justice, particularly in the areas of racial justice, uh, use all the tools that are available to us. You know, another thing, you know, there's this, you know, some some uh, media organizations, the ones that I admire, you know, have a brand, it's a very respectful brand, it's sort of been, I don't know where it came from originally, but it's all the news without fear or favor. And I always looked at ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, as a place um, where, where it was like everyone's rights without fear or favor. And sometimes that meant defending uh, uncomfortable moments, you know, for some people who looked at, you know, people charged with crimes, habeas corpus, you know, certain issues like that. And, and I've always admired ACLU, which to many people seems like a progressive organization defending everyone across the board. I'm just sort of interested in how you know, how is, as we look forward in this notion of a more perfect union, is that scaffolding still there? Absolutely. Uh, 100%. I think it's, an, it's important. We believe that we are working to make sure that we, the people, means all of us, regardless of our beliefs and our positions. We all have um, rights that should be respected and protected. I think that we believe that fighting for equality and fighting for freedom are two sides of the same coin, that you can't have one without the other, that you cannot effectively um, enjoy one without the other. So our work is uh, to make sure that we are defending everyone's rights. And that is certainly a challenge for one organization um, to, to try to make sure that we are engaging in a way where we the people will mean all of us, that no one is excluded, that no one's rights are sacrificed, uh, that no one feels like they are left out of our system and that they don't have someone who's fighting for them. Uh, sometimes that uh, is more challenging than other times. Certainly there are areas where rights may be in tension, but I don't think that that means that any right is prioritized over any other, because again, it's important that we're fighting um, to protect all of our rights. So let me ask you another um, mega question. I'm really enjoying you know, uh, being able to talk with you. I hope, I hope you'll want to come back, because you know, these are things in my mind. You know, one of my colleagues, my former colleagues, at, you know, when I was at the Atlantic, Ta-Nehisi Coates, you know, he wrote Beyond the World and Me, but he also wrote um, about the history of redlining uh, in this country, about how you know, essentially you know, the legacy of systemic racism in this country meant that a lot of people in this country benefited when those that built um, the early foundations of the United States economically and, you know, and, and, and in you know, many other ways, the architecture of this country were built on the backs of slaves. And so I think part of the question is, 
you know, do, do should should we in our modern uh, shape that we're in pay back? And I'm just wondering, are there are there is there such a thing as historic property rights that that we should begin thinking about reparations or beginning to deal with that? And I'm interested in it from a legal framework. You know, ACLU. I'm interested in ACLU of ever picking this up. As just can can something like that of restoring rights to people who were who whose legacy were clearly victims in the past be fixed? You've written really great stuff. I'm you. You wrote White Men's Roads Through Black Men's Homes, Advancing Racial Equity Through Highway Reconstruction. But I want to go further than that. So help me understand what, what might be possible. Yeah, I think it's important for us to understand the connections from the past to today, that we didn't just plop into um, th this year and the inequalities miraculously appear. They've been built over time. It is systemic. And as we work to make sure that we are unraveling um, the systems of inequality and injustice, we certainly have to, um, to look back. And one way to think about it, um, at least the way we think about it at the ACLU in the context of our racial justice work, is first, um, as you said, we do need to reconcile with the past. The scars created by hundreds of years of chattel slavery, by Jim Crow, by racially discriminatory government policies are deep. They're going to require real resources and investments in communities that have been harmed. And here that work has to include advancing the conversation about reparations, what that means, uh, the full breadth of what reparations might mean. It also means challenging the laws that perpetuate racial inequality that started with government-backed laws and policies that mandated that equality, particularly around housing, education, um, and the criminal legal system. But we certainly can't stop there. We have to look forward. And I think that includes uh, work to extend empowerment. The barriers to full participation in the democratic process undermine black and brown voters' true political power. The work here would include protecting and expanding voting rights. Um, it includes a focus on ensuring fair redistricting processes. It, it, it includes challenging voter suppression bills but also forward-looking work that helps expand access to democracy, particularly for communities who have been traditionally marginalized. And I think it includes building prosperity. The gaps in wealth between black and white households exposes accumulated inequality and discrimination, as you said, as well as differences in power and opportunity that can be traced back to this nation's inception. We have to remove those um, uh, those barriers. And finally, I would just say, if we're looking at traditionally how we have entrenched inequality, we have to work to increase access and in order to level the playing field so that every person can achieve their highest potential, we have to ensure access to the tools necessary, necessary to thrive. That includes challenging um, inequality that we see at the intersection of race, class, and place, that the redlining, the, the segregation, because we can't separate the places people have access to from the opportunities that people have access to. Jeremy, let me ask you a, another question, and I don't know how to frame this, but it, you know, it's, it's one of these questions I sometimes think we learn by asking ourselves uncomfortable questions. And so one of the big uncomfortable things for me is January 6th and how to frame it. Um, and you know, meeting and talking, seeing that day happen, uh, an insurrection, I call it an insurrection, and I know, uh, and I think that from my perspective, folks, there were people there who helped design, planned, and knew exactly what was going on. But I also think there were people who were attracted to this because they believe strongly in that. So there's this interesting tension between those who attacked the Capitol and those who went to the Stop the Steal because it's what they believed and they wanted to express their freedom. And sometimes you look at that freedom of expression element. And I'm interested in how you know, when, when we look at it, the, the importance of defending that freedom of expression, even in the sacred act of looking at transferring power. And I'm just wondering if ACLU has had discussions around it, because it must be complicated. No, you know, as you said earlier, fundamental to who we are as an organization and fundamental to our work is protecting um, freedom of speech. It's important for all of the fights that we are engaged in. But we do believe that there's a line between a, a violent uprising, um, attempt to overthrow the government, um, and exercising our freedom of speech. I, I think when we think about what happened on January 6th, a lot of it is about a resistance to a country that is more diverse than it has ever been before, a resistance to um, sharing 
the, the wealth of this nation in terms of access and opportunity and, and resources. And we can't really move forward past that day. We can't move forward past um, the other conversations and issues that are dividing our country until we acknowledge the harms, um, heal those harms, we acknowledge the true motivation behind those. We know this from South Africa, Rwanda, Germany. There, there was truth before there was mm -hmm. reconciliation. And here in the United States, we have a long way to go because right now we are very far from having a conversation that acknowledges truth and reality, a conversation that acknowledges the harms. Um, in fact, if you look at things like uh, the reaction to the 1619 project, mm, to right. anti-racism teaching, to what happened on January 6th, rather than acknowledging harm, the forces of retrenchment are doubling down and denying that those harms even took place. And I right. think the nature of some of those debates are dividing us. It's gonna be hard to overcome. I think about James Baldwin, who said, we can disagree and still love each other unless your disagreement is rooted in my oppression and denial of my humanity and right to exist. Um, and so I believe that equality is at the core of who we are, fundamental American value. Um, freedom shouldn't be an issue of, should be an issue of universal concern. It shouldn't be divisive. Equality and equity be, should be an issue of universal concern. It shouldn't be divisive. And we have to start with acknowledging that before we can move right. forward. Right. And James Baldwin is one of my real heroes. I got to slip in one more. Everybody's saying we're out of time, but I got to slip in one more. Um, okay. Everybody around criminal justice reform, levels of incarceration, is patting themselves on the back on what got done during the, you know, Clinton or I'm sorry, the Trump administration. Bipartisan support for that. I'm like looking at it. and I said, really, you think that's a big deal? I'm just wondering what's the leftover agenda when it comes to criminal justice reform and the. Um, huge levels of incarcerated black and brown people that remain in the U.S. prison system. What do we do to move on that? What are you doing to move on that? Yeah. You said what's left. All of it's left, yeah. right? We've had uh, really important conversations about racialized police violence, um, about racial disparities in our carceral system. And we've opened up a window that has led to these conversations, but not a lot of meaningful uh, movement. We've seen proposals and plans that can move us in the right direction to eliminate some of the racial um, inequalities in our criminal legal system, to put an end or reduce police violence, to fundamentally transform how we view public safety in our communities. Um, but we ultimately have not seen many results. So I think all of the work is yet to be done. Still so much work to be done. Well, Deborah Archer, president of the American Civil Liberties Union, thank you so much for sharing your views with us today and, you know, being in our big program on A More Perfect Union. Thanks, thanks for talking with us. Thank you for having me.